Hello world, it's Siraj, and I've built an automated trading bot called NeuralFund, and I built it with a machine learning library called TensorFlow, and not just any TensorFlow, the new version of TensorFlow, TensorFlow 2.0. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how I built this and what the important features of TensorFlow 2.0 are so that you can make money with it. And by make money, I mean build an AI startup, work at a company that requires that as a dependency of knowledge, do something great with this knowledge that will impact people's lives and make you money. That's the point of this video. And let me start off by showing you how Neural Fund, my automated investment AI works. What it does is it makes predictions about stock prices in the future for various companies in a sector that the user selects, say technology. So within technology, Apple, Google, and say Amazon are three different stocks. And it's gonna use an AI model to predict future prices for each of these stocks. And then based on the stock that is it predicts to be the highest price, it will buy that for you. So it's like an automated hedge fund manager. And rather than having a 20% cut, which hedge fund managers take, it's gonna take a 2% cut. So let me go ahead and demo this for you. So the first step for us is to sign up for Neural Fund. And to sign up, I'm gonna give it a name. And then I'll type in a password, and then I'll hit submit. Great, so I've signed up, and now what I have to do is select the industry that I want my AI to invest in, so I'll select technology, and it's gonna pick some stocks to invest in for me, and I'll click on invest, and now what's gonna happen is it's gonna ask me to complete my charge, so it's gonna ask me for 100 bucks, and I'm gonna fill this out using a fake credit card for testing purposes, and this is using the Stripe API, and once I pay, it's gonna take 2% of that, so two bucks, and it's gonna invest the rest for me. So I'll pay. And once I've paid, see the balance is right now 98 USD, it took the rest. It's going to, so it chose to invest in Apple stock based on its predictions. And so this is just a chart of Apple stock. But the point is that in the background, it is continuously learning about stock prices in the future using TensorFlow serving. I'm gonna talk about how that works in the background. And it's TensorFlow 2.0. This is a this is an automated investment bot, and I'm gonna show you how I built this. All right. So in this tutorial, there are 10 steps. We're gonna start by looking at what some prerequisite videos you should watch are. Then we're gonna talk about the problems with TensorFlow 1.0, how TensorFlow 2.0 fixes those problems. We'll build this stock prediction model in, in Colab. We'll download that model. We'll serve it using TensorFlow serving, and then we'll add some extra functionality like user authentication, payments, and then finally we'll deploy it to the web so users can actually use it. At the end, we'll talk about ways of improving that app. All right, so first of all, if you haven't, go ahead and watch four uh, videos, right? So one is called How to Make Money with TensorFlow, so that was for 1.0, but a lot of the concepts still apply. Then watch Seven Ways to Make Money with Machine Learning, and then watch one of my most recent videos, Watch Me Build an AI Startup, and then watch this playlist called Intro to TensorFlow. Just on YouTube search Intro to TensorFlow, Siraj, and it'll show up. And once you do that, let's talk about some of the problems with TensorFlow 1.0. So first of all, there is this programming paradigm called data flow. The TensorFlow team did not invent this. This existed for a while. And the idea behind, uh, behind data flow is that it creates what's called a static computation graph. So imagine any set of operations in any function or in any equation. We can represent that as a graph where different nodes are operations like add, subtract, multiply, divide, right? And data will flow through these uh, computation graphs operation by operation. Let's say first that you wanna add, then you wanna subtract, and then you wanna divide, right? So there's a, there's a sequence of operations. And a static computation graph can represent these operations. And one way of representing data in these computation graphs is by considering them as tensors. And what are tensors? Tensors are n-dimensional arrays. So that means they are groups of numbers with n dimensions. This could be one dimension, this could be two dimensions, this could be three dimensions, this could be a million dimensions, right? which we can't visualize. And the idea is that these tensors flow through the graph for, from input to output and they make a prediction. And the prediction could, would be the output of the function, tensor flow. And this is great. And the reason they did this is because creating a computation graph in this way, a static computation graph, allows for very easy parallelism. It's easy to distribute computation across different nodes if you abstract the idea of operations to um, 
objects in what is considered object-oriented programming. It makes it easier to have distributed execution across multiple machines. And it's easier to compile and it's more portable because when a static computation graph is created in one language, let's say Python, uh, we can then export it and load it up in a different language because it is language agnostic, all great things. So the idea behind TensorFlow 1.0 was we import our data, define our model, this is a static model, at runtime the data will flow through this static graph and then we'll get some output. And here is an example of some TensorFlow 2.0 code right here. And let me also just write out something very simple so you could see what I mean. So once we've imported TensorFlow, then we can define two constants, right? So the first constant is going to be called a. The second constant is going to be called B. And both of these represent single values. The first represents two, and the second represents three. And once we have these constants, these TensorFlow variables, we can perform operations on these constants. Like let's say C is going to be equal to A plus B, whereas D is going to be equal to A times B. And then once we've done that, then we launch our graph by using what's called the session object. We have a tf.session, and then inside of that session, we perform our uh, operations. Let's say it's add or it's multiply. And when we do this, we can see that it computed this operation, but the problem is that it computed it when we ran that computation graph. So right here is where this operation A plus B occurred, right? So if we wanted to say, well, let's see what B is, right, over here, it's not gonna work, right? Because it is a static computation graph. First we have to define the graph, then we can run the graph. We can't just debug inside of the graph as it's being built. And this is a problem. The second problem is verbosity. So there's so many concepts in TensorFlow, placeholders, variables, uh, hyperparameter values, formatting convention, there's a lot to learn. And we haven't even begun to talk about deep learning theory here. And so this is an example of verbosity. I basically just copied and pasted some code from what's called a DC GAN. Um, it's a type of generative adversarial network, deconvolutional generative adversarial network. And I basically just copied some TensorFlow 1.0 code here to show you that there's a lot happening here. And this can be confusing for beginners. Even if you have coded before, it could still be confusing because there's so many different uh, TensorFlow specific naming conventions here that we have to get to know. You know, global variables initializer, the session, the different types of optimizers, the saver, right? So it's very verbose code. And uh, there's also very messy APIs because they're always adding more to the APIs over time. There's a lot of deprecated APIs. A lot of new packages are being added to this. And I made this meme like, should I use this sequence to sequence or this one? I don't know. And lastly, it's very hard to debug, right? So if we have some value here like x and it's a value called zero, and then we're, we have another value called y and we say, well, y is going to be this value, the log of x plus one divided by x, so we're dividing by zero. And then we say y plus one is c. And then inside of our session, we'll have to say, we'll print out that value of z. Let's see what, what z evaluates to. And of course, it's gonna evaluate as nan, nan. But the, the problem was y, but we, didn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't see that it was y because if we print out y, it's not gonna tell us, hey, the problem was here because y hasn't been compiled. It hasn't been computed yet. It's waiting until the graph is built. So that's what they wanted to fix with TensorFlow 2.0. So there are actually a lot of features that TensorFlow 2.0 has that 1.0 doesn't, but what I've done is I picked the three or four of them that I consider to be the most important, sorry, six or seven of them that I consider to be the most important, and here they are. The first one is that it allows for rapid prototyping by having what's called eager execution mode as the default mode, right? And so eager execution mode is, it, is an imperative programming paradigm that doesn't create a static computation graph. It creates what's called a dynamic computation graph. And this is more Pythonic. It's more in line with how Python was built. And this makes it much easier to debug. It makes it much easier to read the code. It's less verbose. So just having this alone is such an important feature. PyTorch already does this. In fact, Chainer did this about three years ago. Um, but now this is a native, um, concept in TensorFlow, which makes things much simpler to, to understand. And I have this code right here, which I'll compile. So right here, you can see I'm, I'm installing the latest version of TensorFlow 2.0 with this pip command. And then I'll import TensorFlow. It's executing eagerly. 
I'll create this value for x, and then I'll do perform a matrix multiplication using x, and notice how I can then print out that value m, which is x times x, or x dot product x, before creating a session. In fact, there are no sessions anymore, right? All of this can, is being computed with each line. And this is super valuable. In fact, we can also use NumPy natively, right? So we can use NumPy functions to perform operations on these TF variables, like see this constants, et cetera. And notice there's, there's our output exactly as we wanted that to, to work. There were no errors. And like I said, this makes it easier to debug because we can just print out, hey, what's the value of M before computing you know, anything else later on? And it's gonna tell us what that value is. So it makes debugging a lot easier. It's less verbose. And one major reason for this is because they are now using Keras as the high level, the official high level API of TensorFlow 2.0, which is awesome. And so this code right here is an example of training a model and it takes about 45 seconds to train in Colab, which is super good, super short. And the, the, the whole point here is all we have to do is we have to import TensorFlow. We're not importing Keras, why? Because Keras is now built into TensorFlow. And what that means is there, we can call Keras just like that. See this tf.keras uh, module right here? And we're downloading the MNIST data set. We trained it, we tested it, and this will finish training in about you know, a few more seconds, but that's all it took for us to train our model on data using TensorFlow. We built a neural network right here in a few lines using the Keras sequential API. It trained it, it tested it, and then in five epochs, we're done with training. There you go, there's our, it trained right there. Right, so that's super easy. And there's more granular control as well in that we, not only do they have Keras as a new high level API, they have a full lower level API that allows you to access those native um, internal operations that TensorFlow is using, using what's called tf.rawops. But the thing about that TensorFlow team, which they're definitely watching, I tried to search for this in the documentation and I did not find it. So definitely make that easier for developers to, to find, okay? But that's another point that it allows for more granular control at the low level as well as high level. And you might be thinking, well, I wrote a bunch of code in TensorFlow 1.0, how am I gonna convert it to 2.0? They have this nifty little command called TF upgrade v2, and all you have to do is say, here's my old TensorFlow 1.0 file, and here's my new TensorFlow 1.0 file, and it will make all those changes automatically for you, which is awesome. So backwards compatibility, and here's perhaps my favorite feature, TensorBoard is now available inside of Colab. Now TensorBoard, if you don't know, is TensorFlow's way of visualizing your model during training. You can visualize the hyperparameters. You can visualize a lot while it's happening, and it's super, super useful. And using ngrok, which is a tunnel to be able to access this, we can we have TensorBoard right there. And now we can perform all sorts of visual, visualizations as per necessary. You know, we don't have a model right now, but we could perform you know, any kind of visualization right in the cloud. We don't have to download anything. So those are the main points about TensorFlow 2.0 that I thought were worth mentioning because it makes it easier for anybody to enter into this field and that will make it easier for you to build something of value for other people, right? If as long as you can understand these tools at a high level, you can put pieces together to make a prototype and then you can generate value using that, right? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build this stock prediction model with TensorFlow 2.0 in this Colab notebook and then we're gonna train it in the cloud, then we'll download it and then we'll create a web app around that, all right? So let's go to this stock prediction example right here. So inside of this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what's called a transformer neural network to predict prices for one company stock. And I'm just gonna randomly pick a General Electric or Apple, whatever you wanna pick, it doesn't matter. So what I'm first gonna do is import the data. And once I have that data, then I can view that data and see what it is. And so what I did was I pulled uh, the data from Yahoo Finance for GE right here as a text file. And it downloaded that and it showed it to me right here. And we can actually just, if we wanted to, we could manually download it by saying, download data right here. And it will download it as a CSV file and then we upload it to Colab. And so once we have that, we will be able to visualize it as a data frame, right? These are all the prices for, uh, for about 90 days of historical data. And once we have that, we're gonna visualize it right here, okay? The data's going up over time, makes sense. 
And then once we have that data, we're gonna perform a bunch of pre-processing on it. I'm gonna skim through this because there's a lot of pre-processing here. Uh, but it's very basic stuff. We want to reformat it, and you can really just find, copy and paste a lot of this pre-processing code. Um, and then once we have that, we can show what it looks like over time, and then we get to the fun part, which is building our model, which is called the transformer network now. The transformer network has replaced all variations of recurrent networks, that includes LSTM networks, GRU networks, for time series predictions, for sequence prediction, let me clarify, for sequence prediction. And Google invented this for specifically for language translation, and their model, BERT, uses a transformer network. OpenAI's model, GPT-2, uses a transformer network to make word predictions, which allows for text generation. And I have two great videos on how this works in detail. See both of these, OpenAI Text Generator and Natural Language Processing. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna repurpose this transformer network because it's so new for asset price prediction and that is the exciting part. Taking some of these bleeding edge models and reapplying them to use cases that nobody thought about, that is the value that we can bring to people. And this is an example of a transformer network Right here, now remember, all of these machine learning models, these neural models, they're collections of different matrix operations, add, subtract, multiply, divide. And what we do is these boxes represent these matrix operations. And once you get to know a few neural architectures, feed forward, recurrent, you know, uh, hop field networks, once you get to know a few, you realize that they're all just the same thing, but just different ordering of operations. So you kind of just jumble up this pile of matrix math, and that's your new neural network, that's your new architecture, and sometimes you'll achieve state-of-the-art performance with that. That's really how it works. That is AI research, jumbling up these, what are called differentiable blocks, and seeing what's gonna give a better output. And so this is one example. It's an encoder-decoder architecture. Right, so input sequence of past prices, output will be the sequence of the next prices based on what it's gonna predict. And uh, both of those videos should show you in detail how the transformer works. So how did I build a transformer for TensorFlow 2.0? Because I couldn't find one. I could not find a transformer on GitHub, unbelievably, that was written in TensorFlow 2.0. So what did I do? Did I build it from scratch? No, what I did was I found an existing transformer that this guy built on Kaggle. Shu Jian, shout out to Shu Jian. So this was an existing transformer network that this guy built on Kaggle, and it was built for TensorFlow 1.0. And what I did was I copied and pasted it, and I repurposed it for TensorFlow 2.0. So you might be asking, how did you repurpose that for TensorFlow 2.0? And the answer is that it didn't work at first. Once I installed TensorFlow 2.0, what I could have done is I could have used that script that I talked about that converts everything to 2.0, but instead what I did was I just like manually went through and I changed it myself just to learn what the differences are. And it turns out that the only difference was rather than using, check this out, rather than using uh, from keros.models, all of these imports just said keros. What I did was I just had to change it to tensorflow.keros, and then it compiled for TensorFlow 2.0. Why? Because like I said before, Keros is now a part of TensorFlow 2.0. And so there we go, we got a bleeding edge model, never been built before in 2.0, at least publicly, definitely internally they have this at Google, uh, and then it's gonna compile, and hopefully this works. Great, just like that. See, and it's a big model, it's, it's got a lot, there's a lot there. We're not gonna go into all that theory, uh, we built it there and then we fit it and I already have this right here for you, my training code. It's gonna be in the, in the video description. This actually took a while to train. A while meaning 20 minutes, which is not that long. And then we have a prediction of the price right here. Okay, so it's not that good, but it's, it's not bad. It's like there, so we just need more data. But the point is that we trained this in the cloud. We didn't have to use any of our local GPUs and we saved the model by this single line, model.save, mymodel.h5. So this will save it, and then we can download it by just saying, let me download whatever file is here, and using this sidebar, we can download whatever file is there. So great, now that we have trained a model, we want to serve this model to a user in the form of a web app. So let me take some time to help explain TensorFlow serving to you. I really think this is one of the most powerful tools in the entire machine learning pipeline, and it's because 
Sometimes you want, you want a model to be able to continuously learn from data, right? You don't wanna just train a model, it's trained on data, it's static, you serve it to a user and it's just always there. You want it to continuously learn over time and TensorFlow serving allows your model to gracefully do this because there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. And that's why Google built it for themselves because they have these continuous training pipelines internally for tools like search and maps, et cetera. So the idea is that it, there, it's, it's got this version control system built in where you have a version of the model, let's call it model one, and it's trained on some data, and, it, and you know, users are making requests to this model, post requests, get requests for inference, and this is happening, but in the background, another version of this model is training on new data. And once this model has fully trained on new data, it will gracefully phase out that original model and it will phase in the newly trained model. And then once that's in, it's gonna be training another one. Now this is just one version of how you could do this, right? You can do this several ways. You can have multiple models. You can have multiple models training, multiple models serving. You can combine data from multiple outputs to create some ensemble technique. There's a lot we can do, but to, to be very simple about this, TensorFlow Serving allows you to create models that serve users in a production environment that allows you to experiment very fast. And so think about how the data science pipeline looks. And if we look at the production grade ML pipeline, writing that ML code that we just did is such a small part of it, right? There's configuration, there's monitoring, and this is all considered DevOps, right? Serving, analysis, machine resource management, there's a lot. So TensorFlow Serving takes care of all of that for us, which is awesome. So, you might be thinking, well, why can't I just use a regular web framework like Django or um, you know, what have you, like Flask, to do this? Well, you could. You could wrap a simple model with an API like Flask or whatever, but there's some really good reasons we don't wanna do that. The first reason is that serving is faster because it was optimized for a continuous versioned model environment because that's what they do at Google, right? They have CPUs and GPUs and sometimes TPUs and they have to allocate resources efficiently both in terms of memory and in terms of space. So it has better time complexity to be computer science -y about it and it has better uh, space efficiency. And this version control system that's built in is just amazing. That's exactly what we want to happen. And more importantly, they use it for their you know, very scaled, very production grade products, so we should use it as well. And um, you might be thinking, well, does it use HTTP? Does it use gRPC? And it used to use gRPC, and there's this great talk by my previous company, Twilio, I love you Twilio, that explains how gRPC works, but recently they added HTTP support as well, so that's a great thing as well. So it uses both. Now let's consider some concepts inside of TensorFlow Serving, okay? So this is a, this is a, an image of the pipeline, the life cycle of what's called a servable. And a servable is the central abstraction of TensorFlow Serving. It's just the name of an object. You know, an object can be named anything. And inside of this programming paradigm, a servable represents a model, so a fully trained model. But it doesn't just have to be a model. It could also be some other algorithm, you know, some kind of, any kind of algorithm. But servables are that central layer of abstraction that users, users will perform inference on or with. And so the idea is that for a servable, a servable could be, let's say in our case, it's going to be that fully trained stock prediction model, okay? So that's our servable. Now this servable will have versions to it. There's a first version, a second version, a third version. And if we take those versions, we can consider it as a stream. And so in Git, the analogy would be a DAG, right? A directed acyclic graph to be computer science -y about it. But in the TensorFlow serving paradigm, there, the servables make up a stream with all of their versions in it. And models in, in the serving paradigm can represent multiple servables. So an actual model can represent multiple models. But we don't have to consider models right now, let's just consider servables, because we're not gonna have to deal with that ourselves. Then there are loaders. So loaders will manage a servable's life cycle and a loader will pull a servable using a source. So the source object has direct input output access to your file system. So a source will pull that model from your file. The loader will use the source to load that model into, into memory. And then a manager, which is kind of the controller in this pipeline, will detect what the aspired version is in which we can write logic for. Like which version of a model do we want to serve to a user? the newest one, one that's trained you know, in 30 days, and TensorFlow has some default aspired versions for us, which we can use as well. But the manager will handle the full life cycle of a servable. The manager will say, okay, we want to use this aspired version, okay? And core is the highest level 
um, super class of everything, Tensor, uh, TensorFlow Serving Core, which wraps everything here. So let me outline the steps here. So first of all, we train a model called a transformer on data and use it for inference. Then we train it on newer data. So a user is inferencing this version of our transformer in real time, but meanwhile, we're training an, it again on newer stock data that it's pulling from the web via an API. And so the source plugin creates a loader for a specific version of this model. And this loader has all the metadata necessary to load this servable computation graph. It points to it on the disk. The source, uh, the source then notifies the manager of the aspired version, which is this one right here, this green graph, the loader will then tell the source, okay, load the new version based on that version policy which specified the aspired version. And then it will pull that from the file system into the source, into the loader. The loader will then give it to the manager. The manager will then hand that servable, that the, the result of that inference request back to the client and that's how it works. So this is so this version system is happening in real time, and uh, that's how TensorFlow Serving works at a high level. It has HTTP and gRPC support, and now it's we're on to step six of this tutorial. We want to build TensorFlow Serving. So how are we going to do this? Well, the easiest way I found was to use this base repository called Simple Simple TensorFlow Serving. Great stuff. What this guy did was he implemented all of these serving features, right? RESTful HTTP APIs, supporting inference, acceleration for GPU, supporting dynamic online and offline model versions, basically everything we would want that we would have to build from scratch, which we don't have to. Remember, this is a mentality that I want you guys, you wizards, the loves of my life. This is a mentality that I want you to adopt, because it's my mentality. This mentality of rapid experimentation, of not doing anything that is unnecessary, fastest method to prototype. If there exists components, if there exists pieces of a puzzle in terms of code on GitHub, we don't have to build that ourselves, right? The first version of Uber just combined a bunch of existing APIs together and slapped a pretty interface on it, right? Uber used payments from Stripe, maps from Google, which did everything. It showed where drivers were. It even did routing for them. Of course, nowadays, they have their own routing algorithms using deep RL and some amazing work. But my point is, when it comes to a prototype, just put pieces of the puzzle together to get something very basic out there and then improve it over time. So my point of saying all of that is that we're going to build off of this existing simple TensorFlow serving demo, add all of our functionality to it, and that is the first version of our app. So let's get right to it. I'll first of all download this app and it's gonna take a while to download. Let's see what it asks us to do. Okay, so we just have to install it. We could either install it with pip from the source. So we'll go ahead and install it from the source. So what we have to do is say setup.py, as it's saying right here in GitHub, let me make this bigger. Terminal is my safe space. Install. Ha, huh, awesome. Now we will develop, as he says here, or she, develop. Great. And lastly, we'll do a Bazel build of it. Awesome, okay, so that all of that worked. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the server with a saved model. So this app allows us to load different types of models by specifying, okay, simple test for serving, and then what's the model that we wanna load, and hopefully this works. Okay, so now we have this app running on our local machine called T Simple TensorFlow Serving, and it allows us to load up any type of model that we want, and there are a lot of different models that this guy has put into this app, and we can see those models right here. So models, in fact, we'll just look at it on our local machine. Let's check it out. All these different models for MNIST, for detecting iris flowers, you know, all those different types of models we have here. Models that were trained in MXNet that we can then convert into TensorFlow using Onyx and different language agnostic tools, library agnostic tools. The whole point is notice how the models are stored right here and they have both a protobuf file and a variables file. Those are the only two dependencies. So using this boilerplate template application, we can train a model like we just did in the cloud, load it or serve it via this web app and wrap all sorts of functionality around it like user authentication, et cetera. And it will be able to predict using that data just like we saw right here. 
So let's take a look at this code and see what exactly it's doing and, and how it's doing what it's doing. So if we go into this code, let me make it a little bit bigger. Let's go into what looks like the main code. Server, server.py, that looks important. So in server.py, we see that it's using Flask and it's wrapping, it's both using Flask and TensorFlow serving. So Flask creates an, AP, an HTTP API and then internally it's using serving for model versioning. And inside of this, we'll, we'll see that depending on which um, model you choose, a different inference service is loaded up, right? So we can, have, we can have Onyx, we can have a PyTorch model, we can have a TensorFlow model. And so in that example, we loaded up a TensorFlow model. Then there are the, route, there, there are the routes, the routes for the different uh, web pages that we have. And we just need to add routes for user login and then you know, a payment, like, like purchase. And then, uh, then we can leverage these existing routes, these existing functions like do inference. So, okay, but I'm very curious as to what this TensorFlow inference service looks like because that's the one we're using here. So for TensorFlow inference service, what it's doing is exactly what we talked about. See, there's a function right here for dynamically reloading models, right? So it starts a new thread to load models periodically. So it'll load up a model to start off, and this is just continuously running. It'll load the model to start off that we feed it when we, when we launch it, and then it's got functions for dynamically reloading models, creating new threads, loading saved models, and it's gonna call these as per the manager's requests, right? So a lot of this boilerplate is already abstracted away from us, so all we have to do is define what that initial model looks like, and then it's going to load up new versions of that model. However, we do have to define where that data, that new training data is coming from. And so what we can do is we can find in this code where it's asking for training data and then we can modify it. So inference right here. So inference is happening within the context of dynamically loading and reloading models, right? So inference is what's constantly happening. Okay, so inside of this training.py uh, file right here, we'll notice that it is preparing training data from a local directory. So we can modify this so that it will download data using the Yahoo Finance API from a specific date. It will format that data, it will turn it into a request, and it will then make a prediction using it. But right now, we don't want to make a prediction, we just wanna download that data as a request and then format it as an input. And then we'll say, we'll create a placeholder around it, shape equals none, and then we will say, this request JSON data, it's not like that, this is input data. tf.placeholder, this is our train data actually. So there, so this is the training file. So whenever a model needs to train, it's going to use this and it's gonna continuously use that new data that we are pulling from the web via this API. Then inside of inference, it's going to make, it's going to perform inference. And these models are going to be trained dynamically, right? So all of these functions, load, saved model version, dynamically reload models load custom operations. This is happening in real time as part, as part of our TensorFlow inference service, which is all we needed to do was define where that new data input is coming from. We already, we've already trained that data um, from the previous stock data, and then we'll define an interval, like let's say every 30 days, or sorry, every two hours, we'll train a new model every one hour, you know, we can change that up. But the point is using a timer. But the point is that we now have an inference service, it's running in real time, and now we want, to, uh, we want to create user authentication, we want to create uh, payment functionality, and we want to add that to our existing TensorFlow serving app. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that just last week I made this AI startup prototype which did a lot of this boilerplate code which I can copy and paste. So basically in the layout, I said, you know, here's my background color. I generated that logo using the tool brandmark.io I talked about before. And then I said, okay, so here's the, here's the logo right here that I just added as a source. I uploaded it to Imgur, right? Neural Fund, named it that, placed it there. And then I used Stripe to create that payments file, which is in layout 
.html. So here's the pay, here's the payment page, right? So if the user has the, if the user has authenticated, make them pay, and then it's going to make a charge to post. So I'll just take these files and copy them to this existing repository. And once those files are in my templates file, now it's going to, inst I, I basically took all that existing code. I'm only using the backend code, so none of that front end code. Whenever a user logs in, it's gonna use a SQL database to store that username and password. Then it's going to say, well pay, with Stripe, and then the user pays with Stripe, 100 bucks, which I hard-coded in, it could be anything. It's gonna take two of those bucks, send them to my personal Stripe account, and then the rest of it, the $98, it's going to invest using uh, the Quandle API, and then any other APIs we wanna invest with. And we're gonna, we're gonna store all of those tokens, the token for the specific user ID, a token for the specific payment ID that this user made, and the specific model that the user is using inside of the SQL database as rows, and that makes it easy to find an index. And once we have that, then we can add that, the rest of the logic for, so we have the inference logic, we have the user auth logic, we have the um, payment logic, it's just a simple stripe, and then the rest of it is just formatting HTML so it looks nice. So recall how in the original demo that I had here, I basically just copied and pasted this uh, line chart uh, to just show the Apple price. And I, I also hard coded it to choose Apple, but what we can do is we can, but it's predicting using that time series data, right? What the next best price would be. What we can do is have it perform inference on several different stock prices, find the delta between the prediction and the actual result. And whichever one has a smaller delta, we'll use that one and we'll invest in that. So we'll do a stock price dot invest whatever the price is, right? So we, we need to authenticate with some stock API, but which, you know, there's several. I like the Quandle one, but there's, there's several of them. Alpaca, commission-free API, stock brokerage. You can build and trade with real-time market data for free. You get an API key, and then you can, you know, use it with zero commission, which is awesome. So we have connected our API for stock price pulling and making purchases. We have integrated that with Stripe, user auth, and inference, and not just any inference, dynamically, continuously, training inference using TensorFlow serving, and not just any TensorFlow serving, TensorFlow 2.0. There's a lot more to this code. You'll find it all in the video description. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, let me know in the comment section. I'm always trying to improve my content, improve my code quality, improve the topics that I'm talking about to make sure that I am providing as much value as possible for you guys. It is a Saturday morning, and I'm here recording this because I love you guys, and I want this to be released very soon. So I hope you found this video educational and inspirational. What's the next AI startup you're gonna build? Let me know in the comment section and please subscribe for more programming videos. For now, I've gotta invest in myself. So thanks for watching.